Hello everyone, welcome back to Wednesday here on The Pagan Perspective. I'm your host Eric, and this week we've got a lot to cover. So, <clears throat> we actually have two different subjects, or two different topics from two different users, both with more than one part. So, the first user, Lamiabella14, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, asks us, how did we learn about our past starting out? Books, meetings, one-on-one -on -one classes, etc. And how did we find our resources and our teachers? Now, first I have to apologize, I'm starting to get a cold, so I have a cough drop in my mouth. If it's clicking too much, I apologize. Uh, the way I learned about my path was actually through friends and friends of friends and friends of family and other various things like that. Um, when I very first started out um, looking into other religions, it wasn't actually because I was sick of the religion that I had grown up with. It was because I was interested. Uh, I started out under a relatively Christian faith. I don't know if everybody calls Mormonism Christian. But uh, I started out as a Mormon, LDS. Latter-day Saint, whatever you want to call it, um, and I was hanging out with my oldest brother and one of his roommates at the time, who worked at a store called Glyphics. Glyphics is kind of a new age shop, it doesn't exist anymore, but they had all sorts of things in there from aura cameras to rune stones, which is actually where I got started. So I set of rune stones and went, oh, those are really, really interesting, so I got a set and I started using them. I had a little bit of an introduction through tarot. Uh, but when I found the runes, I found those far more interesting and easier to use. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, that was before I had actually left the, the LDS church. But uh, after that, I, you know, my friend would introduce me to another friend, would introduce me to another friend who eventually became kind of a mentor figure for me in, in getting into paganism at that point, which was a few years later. I had decided that I didn't want to be LDS anymore, so I moved into a pagan path. And uh, he would invite me to his sabbats and other various rituals, and I would attend and participate, and I found it to be really interesting. Well, after a while, I decided that the way he did it was not exactly the way I wanted to do it, so I went off on my own, and that's kind of where I've been. So, the, you know, initially it was friends and friends of friends who let me hang out with them and help let me watch and, and help and whatnot. Uh, the second part of uh, Lamiabella 14's question is how do we stay safe when seeking out a mentor on online or in person? Um, I would say the say the best your best bet is to not not allow somebody to be your mentor or teacher unless you trust them. Um, if it's an acquaintance, I would say they're probably not your mentor. Uh, if they are someone you kind of know, they're probably not your mentor. Um, they could be your advisor, but not necessarily somebody you look up to. Those kinds of people I would treat as equals, and then if you trust them, then they could be a mentor or a spiritual guidance counselor. I was spiritual mentor at that point. Um, I hope this answers your question, Lamia Bella, but uh, if not, leave me information in the comment section. Next, the next user is, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this, if I'm totally off here, but Can I Has Productions. Uh, he wrote in, or she, I'm sorry, I don't know, uh, wrote in, is casting a circle really necessary? Well, only as necessary as locking your doors. Um, setting space, casting circle, cleansing, things of this nature are intended to keep out the things or push out the things that can cause us harm or discomfort or those, those, that nature of thing um, spiritually. So if you want to keep yourself safe in your home physically, you lock the doors and you hope nobody breaks through them. When you're talking about in ritual and in, you know, sabbats and, and just rituals of that nature, magic and spells and whatnot, 
you want to protect yourself somehow, and if you don't want to protect yourself somehow, then that's that's fine too, I suppose. But I always think of uh, I always think of casting a circle or setting space or cleansing or what have you. I always think of that as kind of the same as locking my doors when it, before I go to bed. Uh, the second part is. Uh, the second part of his qu uh, the the can I has productions question was, does harm none in the Wiccan read also pertain to animals? I have never actually read the Wiccan read, so I can't say for certain. Uh, I can't say how the wording is, but the spirit of the idea is that during ritual and at harm none, do as ye will. So I would say that yeah, it does. I mean, living the Wiccan read and any other various texts to the letter of the law is a terribly difficult thing to do, if not a terrible idea. Uh, the point is that you don't intentionally harm anything, especially in spell work, especially during ritual, especially when you're, you know, shifting things around to suit your will. Now, um, I don't often make reference, and actually I've never made reference to this before, either in a video or in person to anyone, but uh, I've read a very little bit of the Satanic Bible, and even in the Satanic Bible, it states that if you are unwilling to sacrifice your own blood for ritual and for magical purposes, what makes you think that you have any right to sacrifice the blood of an animal? Or anyone else for that matter. But <clears throat> taking this into account, yes, it's a satanic Bible, but that's not the point. The point is that's really good advice. Uh, if I need blood in ritual, and I know this sounds like kind of a tangent, but it's really not. If I need blood in ritual, I'm going to give my own because I'm not, I don't have the authority to ask anybody else to do it or make anybody else to do it. But this really stops. The point of, this, the point of where this stops is protecting yourself. If you have to harm someone to protect yourself, you have every right, both physically and spiritually, to do so. Um, legally as well, in most places. Uh, so, yeah. And at harm none, do as you will, applies to animals? Yes. Yes. However, if, like, for a really specific example, if a coyote comes to kill your sheep, you are not only within your rights of the law, but within the rights of the breed, in my opinion to kill that coyote to protect you and yours. So very lastly, and I hope I get to this before it all shuts down, and I'm sorry if it doesn't, does an athame have to be double-edged? Well, I don't know. I have an athame. It happens to be double-edged. Uh, the one I had before that was a Leatherman, so not really. Uh, it worked. My old one worked just as well until it fell apart, in which case I decided I needed something a little more functional. But, uh, I think form follows function when it comes to ritual tools. I don't think tradition follow, or fo I, don't, I don't think form needs to follow tradition. So does it have to be double-edged? No. Not in my opinion, and not from anything I've ever felt or heard. I could be totally off keel on this when it comes to uh, Wiccan rites and whatnot, but again, as I've said before, I'm not a Wiccan. So, I really do hope that this video answered your questions and at least gave you my spin on things. Um, I look forward personally to watching the rest of the videos for this week because this is really kind of interesting topics. Um, thanks everybody for watching and of course, until next time, Odin be with you.